Hello everyone, thank you for attending this presentation. Today I will be talking about lessons learned in creating a mechanical ventilator with open hardware and open source software. My name is Luis Herrera, I am Senior Consultant Developer at Thoward. I have been working uh, in the technology industry for more than seven years, in which I have been doing system migrations to the cloud, implementing uh, continuous integrations and continuous delivery process, implementing a scalable architectures, architectures and big projects. So specifically at the beginning of the pandemic situation, together with a group of expert engineers in the area of automotive and electronic, I was working on, a, on the building and extension of an emergency mechanical, mechanical ventilator. And across this process that ended with a medical approval, we faced uh, and solved multiple challenges that I'm going to share with you on this pres presentation. So I'm going to cover these uh, four topics. So first, I'm going to talk about the project that we de developed and the outcomes uh, we accomplished. Also, then on the topic number two, I'm going to talk about evolutionary software architecture but related to microcontrollers. So I'm going to share it with you how we got medical requirements and how we translated it to architecture characteristics. On the topic number three, I'm going to talk about this test strategy oriented to combine hardware and software. So here we found some challenges about testing and I'm going to share it with you these challenges because it's something common on the IoT project. On topic number four, I'm going to talk about continuous integration and deployment for microcontrollers. So we know that this is a common practice for software development, but when we add hard hardware, and where then we need to find new character, new mechanics to do it in an scalable way. So let's start the project development. On the month of May and April, together with a group of, of expert engineers and with the uh, Oxy Oxygen Project community support, we made an emergency mechanical ventilator that today is published on the Oxygen community page. So we did this um, in order to solve this problem. So if a person presents serious symptoms caused by the virus, Italy, they will, uh, they will have access to an intensive care unit bed, which have me mechanical ventilators and other emergency mechanics. The problem, the problem in our country, Ecuador specifically, is that at that time in May, there were only two, 256 intensive care unit beds without taking into account that in several cities, there was not even even one intensive care unit bed. So if someone presented respiratory problems, they will not have an intensive care unit bed and therefore a mechanical vent ventilator at their disposal. Faced with this uh, situation, we were encouraged to build a mechanical ventilator from a base of a device tested on and validated in Spain called Oxygen Project IP, which is open hardware. So on the process of building the device, we use the next tech stack. As I mentioned, it, we built it based on the Oxygen Project. And since that we, we started uh, with the first versions, we built it the, the wooden version. And after some tests, we move it to the IP version, which is designed to be built in factories. Okay, so on the hardware, we also use Arduino uh, to provide configurability and another feature to the device. And this was the value that we added. We, uh, we extended it and made it configurable. On the other hand, we also use Raspberry Pi in order to provide a graphical user interface and see the values related to the volume, pressure, and airflow in real time, and also to send data to the cloud in, in order to provide traceability. On the software side, we use a platform which provides multiple benefits, like a library for testing and agent 
to connect uh, with remote device. Also, we use we use C plus plus in order to develop new libraries and to extend what we had found that was open source. Also, we use a Docker to containerize application development on Node.js and GitHub Actions to implement continuous integrations and continuous deployment pipelines. Okay, so let's start now on with evolutionary architecture. And before that, let's talk a little bit about what means architecture. The industry, the industry had made a great effort to, to precisely define software architecture. Some architects refers to software architecture as the blueprint for the system, while others define it as a roadmap for the system development. So based on, on the definition made by um, Mark, Richard, and Nidfor in their book, Fundamentals of Software Architecture, we see that in this definition, software architecture consists of, consists of the structure of the system combined by the architecture characteristics the system must support, architecture decisions, and finally, design principles. So following these four principles mentioned, ideally, we can define a good software architecture. But as we know, over the time, the business requirements change, and so the technologies that and even good practice to develop software can become bad practice. So then, once I have built an architecture, how I can prevent it from gradually degrading over time? So here is when the the need of find a mechanic to prevent the important characteristic of architecture is born. The term of evolutionary architecture by Need for Rebecca Parson and Patrick Wa that says an evolutionary architecture supports guided incremental change across multiple dimensions. So in our project, we were deciding on each step that the architecture characteristic will be our guided. Uh, of what we, we need to implement and what pattern we could use to do it. And of course, to eat, to eat uh, incrementally, and of course, to do it incrementally, since that we will be pivoting because at the moment, uh, at, at that moment, there was not a, meca um, a medical guideline to assess an uh, emergency mechanical ventilator. In this, in this building process, our clients were doctors and paramedics of the intensive care unit who in the initial stage told us that the device should have a mechanic to at least measure pressure and frequency, um, with uh, which the first four characteristics of, of the device uh, appeared. And that were configurability, extensibility, and um, accuracy. And configurability, we have already covered since that we were using Arduino microcontroller. So we could param param parameter the device functionality with that. So let's start with the first one. Sorry, with the second one, this is extensibility. This was, this was one of the features that also later allowed to us iterate quickly because of the easy of adding controls and functionality at the software level. And we cover it by creating libraries for the different sensors and controls that we had in the device. Then how we cover accuracy. To meet this characteristic, uh, we added to the device uh, a LED display of 16 columns at two rows which allowed, to, allowed the user, in this case, the doctor who, ha, who was managing the device, to know what, to know that he was configuring in real time. In this case, a time by using the potentiometer. In this case, yeah, using the potentiometer. On this part, in the future, we got a good learning. One was because on this screen, we were printing a technical message on the road, on the road one, and we were showing time two seconds, as, as you can see on the on the slide. And that message never was interpreted by the doctor and paramedics as frequency, since that 
they react the message in a different way. So another language, another learning um, was at the, at the building of process, as you can see the image, the device is composed by multiple spreads and bolts, and each one have a functionality. If you put one of another size, the device, after a couple of hours of active war, it starts to fail, and that goes a good lesson for us because we were using another size uh, at, at the beginning, and you can imagine the results. So we started this journey on March 24th, and as you can see on the image, uh, we built the, the wooden version that was one of the first versions released by the Oxygen project, and we worked remotely. So we found that so we found somehow the way to collaborate in a distributed way, since that at that moment we were living in a different ways, but in a different sorry, in a different cities, but we were building a, a embed, embedded system. So we combined in, in this in this um, in this way software and hardware. So on April on April fifth, we delivered our first version of the device and we got the doctor's approval. Uh, but this was a, a, a CD approval and in order to get the national approval, we should go to the to the capital city and run tests on the sophisticated laboratory. So on this process, Kia Motors decided to join into the project and sponsor us in order to collaborate with, with improve or changes and then build it on the Kia Motor Factory to donate to the hospitals. And on April 11, we ran the first test on the capital city, but at that moment, since that the Ecuadorian legislation, there was not a document or law that could tell us what are the guidelines that we should follow, we, we got not the, the approval. So all, all, all device was not approved at that moment. And it was evaluated based on the doctors and paramedic experiences. Um, they decided that in order to approve, uh, in order to provide their approval, the device should have another functionality, which they found are essential for doctors and paramedics, like uh, see in a real time a color in a col on a color screen, the pressure, the volume, the frequency, the airflow and visual or audible alarms. And as you can see here, the requested frequency, uh, that was something that we already already have done, but since that, we're, that we were using a tech language, they not accepted that because they thought at the moment that it could generate confusion with the end user. So we, so we translated the client business language to the technical one, and we found these three characteristics that are which are traceability, failure transparency, and simplicity. So how we accomplish the first one? So this, so this characteristic, which was also essential to know what was happening since uh, since the first time that we that the machine is turning on. And also for draw the graph on the on the screen, we could accomplish it by transmit transmitting or sending data by a serial by the serial port uh, from the microcontroller to the computer. In this case, it, the computer was the Raspberry Pi. So on the microcontroller, we defined a structure to transmit the data, and we used it across all the system. So. This was the way how we could accomplish it, this, uh, this characteristic. Then, failure transparency. To, miss, to meet this characteristic at, uh, at the software level and combine it with the hardware, we used uh, some global variables uh, that, we, that were accumulated and once, once they passed the limit values uh, that we set at the start of the device, it emitted the alarm signal to turn on uh, the red LED and the buzzer. The buzzer is a kind of device 
that emit a, a sound. So we could accomplish it, this visual and audio alarm requirements in this way. Then we have simplicity. So to accomplish, the, to, to accomplish uh, this characteristic, we added buttons to the device, uh, which, which uh, will allow to the user to set the control mode either by volume or frequency. So this way we have two options um, to run the device. And also another thing that we added or another option we added to, that we added to the device was to select the install cam. So basically we added, uh, we added that functionality because the device is composed by uh, ambush back and by a can, this can do a pressure to the back and, and, and with that, this emit, uh, this emit uh, the, the, the bullion of the airflow and the airflow. Um, and a, another functionality that we added also with these three buttons is a possibility to reboot or to reset the device. Um, then, Another functionality that we also added was, or another functionality that is, of course, related with the architecture was the testability. And now we are going to talk about, about it more in deep because this is, this is a really big topic um, since that we combine this software and hardware. So testing in microcontrollers, in microcontrollers is a testing process to check the functionality, the functional and non-functional attributes of both software um, and hardware. In a, that if we combine this, this becomes embed, embedded system. In order to ensure, in order to ensure that the final product is free of defects, the main purpose of embedded testing is to verify and validate whether or not the final hardware and software product meets the customer's requirement. So software testing in embedded system is an excellent approach to ensure safety and critical applications such as medical equipment, aviation, automotive industry, and so on. And maybe this image is familiar for you because we commonly, we commonly see it in the software testing, but we can use the same reference for, for system that involves hardware. Although the cost is higher for science that is higher for this kind of project that, that involves hardware, um, science that usually not all the developers can have uh, the device for testing purpose. All right, so how are tests, unit testing on embedded system? For embedded system on this test type, developers test at the module level by writing substitute objects uh, that we know as mock uh, to replace, to, in order to replace the rest of the system hardware and software. So in this case, uh, the developer mocks both. Uh, and, and at this point in the development cycle, the test focus on the log logical performance of the code and are usually executed quickly. Here we can see an example of how we can run tests uh, for embedded system. All right, so then let's talk about integration testing for embedded, for embedded system. And this have a unique feature, which is focused on the actual device on which the software is running. And this makes a little more complex to write tests because it is really complex to simulate conditions um, comparing to the unit test. Uh, this take a little longer to be executed and you need and another thing is 
that you need to have access to the device to run it. So if you have a, a big thing, uh, definitely you, will, you, you, you need to find a way to, to have access or to provide access to the device and in order to run uh, integration tests. So here we have another example of how uh, we run tests in our project. This is specifically integration tests. Okay. So then we have in this process when we were doing this type of this different type of stuff, this um, we didn't talk um, more deeply about about end-to-end -end tests because on that process uh, that kind of test was uh, manually and that was uh, done by the doctors and paramedic uh, that was. And that were the, the stakeholders uh, compromised with the project. So they were doing that end-to-end uh, -end test. And as I mentioned before, they were doing manually. So basically, that kind of test, uh, usually um, uh, usually uh, that, the, that was longer test. So uh, that uh, take almost one or two days uh, to accomplish that end-to-end -end test. But on the in unit and integration test, we found some challenges uh, that I'm going to tell a, uh, a little bit. So the first one was hardware dependencies. It's one of the main difficulties uh, that we face at, uh, during the integration testing, since that in some case, there is limited access to the hardware. Um, in, some, in some case, Emulate, emulators and simulators can be used, but they might not accurately represent the behavior of the actual device. Device um, could give a wrong idea of the system performance and the usability of the application. So then we have open source software library, and most models of the IoT area uh, have open source library. Um, Regularly, this comes without automated testing. So there is a, a, great, a great range of test combinations um, and resulting scenarios that you can do when you implement it in a, in a new hardware that you are building. And that was something that happened to us. So since that we were using some open source library, after we implemented it, we, we we was we were told how we could test this because it was a different a different uh, combinations that we did at that moment uh, and the scenarios that we wanted to cover was uh, a little a little different of how the library was built at the, or was yeah was building at the beginning another aspect that uh, this is related with the FET, that is software uh, versus, versus hard, hardware. Uh, another aspect is that we, when, when you are developing software for newly created hardware, there are possibilities that you could face with hardware failures um, at the building phase. So to the FET that you could phone are not li limited to the software, uh, since that it can also be related to the hardware. We face it that every time that we change it uh, in, in, in our project, every time that we change it, the version of our device, um, that was two times that we did uh, this change. Um, and simple things like install a button uh, <laughs> could fade in this part. So, so yeah, and sometimes you could think that it's software, but the truth is that it's, it's something related with the hardware. Then we have reproducible defects. Defects are more difficult to reproduce or recreate on embedded system. This makes the build process, process, procedure 
appreciate each defect substantially more than the standard case. Apart from, from gathering as much data as sensibility needed to alter the system to find the, the basis of the defect. So this is happening also to us when we, when we change it to another version, as, as I mentioned also in the previous uh, challenges that we resolved. And this was more specifically when we installed a sensor that was working with uh, inverted logic. So when you detect it, when this was detecting something, it was emitting zero, and when and when not, it was emitting one. So we thought that we had at uh, at that moment a software defect, but since that we had some tests, some automated tests, we could see it in a fast way that the problem was on the sensor. All right, let's go back to the journey that related with the test of the device. So after the doctor's recommendation, we started working on the improvements together with Kia Motors, uh, with the support of Kia Motor. And when we ran the next test on April 20, 27th, we've, um, yeah, we ran this, um, but at this moment, the device was not approved. Um, at this moment, uh, they recommended to us to do another change. change. But finally, on at May 12, on Ecuador was published for first time a normative or a law uh, that have the guidelines on which any initiative related with mechanical ventilator could be assessed. So it was really helpful for us because for first time we have something to follow and to build our device and this was also helpful for another initiative um, because we at that moment the on the, on the country uh, were a multiple initiative related with mechanical ventilators so based on the new leg legislation or, or law we did some improve in our device and we started to have progress on the on the on the approbation process. We did our final final test on another laboratory, and it was successful. So then, we were ready to to deliver our emergency mechanical ventilator. And that moves us to the next part. That is, as you can see here, this amazing these amazing people uh, did possible um, what we accomplished. And also, as you can see, all this interaction that we have in this short time, in this short period of time. But in this image, also, you can see that we had, or that we did uh, three different versions, starting from the wooden version, and then to the most sophisticated version. So we delivered our device on the Esmeralda City where this project started in an official ceremony where was present local authorities. And this is how it looks the device that worked with uh, the ambulance back and a cam. So yeah, let's play the video. All right, so then let's move to the next part that is continuous integration and continuous deployment. We think that we, what made possible iterated in a, in, a, in a fast way, definitely was the implementation of continuous integrations and continuous delivery process from the beginning. So after, after the develop that we made, uh, and you create, I mean, create a new feature or extend it as was really easy. Um, so in this, in this part, we created a, a kind of workflow. Um, 
as I mentioned at the beginning, we used GitHub Actions in order to integrate um, and, and deliver uh, the software to the hardware. So how, how looks this process? So basically, let's say that uh, a developer complete a feature or extend, extended one, this developer um, do a push to the repository. So then we have, on this part, we have the GitHub actions that is listening for any change on the, on the main branch. So basically when a new change um, is done on this branch, this, um, this uh, pipeline is triggered and they, this pipeline start getting all the code that uh, have the, the, the main branch then this proceeds to install dependencies and as the first step this start to run unit tests and for that unit test basically um, what we need at that moment is the core c++ language and some libraries so this is how we can how we accomplish it to run this unit test then after this pass is done and in a good way, I mean, all the tests pass in this in this in this step. Then, as next step, the pilot runs integration test. And for that, at the beginning, we thought that we could use Arduino, um, I mean, and some libraries. But the truth was, at the moment, that as I mentioned, also something that of the challenges that I mentioned before. In order to run integration tests, we need the device or we need to the communication with the device. So in order to accomplish this part, we use it, uh, platform or platforming agents. So basically, we we run a platforming agent in a Raspberry Pi, and this was connected to the internet. But also, this Raspberry Pi have connected an Arduino by uh, USB. So every time that a new developer was doing a change, the pilot was using an agent and this agent was talking to the Raspberry Pi and since the Raspberry Pi have access to the real device, all these integration tests were, uh, all these integration tests were working in a good way. So that was how we accomplished the uh, room or have a communication with the uh, with a real device. And then also this this step worked for the deployment firmware. Since that we have connected to the to the real device and the unit test, the integration test was working in a good way, then the last step that we had is to deploy the firmware. So how looks this um, pilot? So the good part of, of GitHub action is that you can define it um, with code, so we define it is by using this pilot as code, and we we added another part. I mean, we added the part to communicate with uh, with the device. As you can see on the line 29, the way that we can communicate with with uh, with the agent is by using a token that you generate the first time that you. I mean, when, after you do the login, you generate that token, and then this is the way how the, the pilot can talk to the device. And most important here is that you can inject it by using secret. So there is not a risk, um, you know, to, be, to dispose this information. All right, so this is an example of how to, the pilot runs. So this is the first step where it's building and running tests. The first one is unit test. And this is, uh, well, this is fast, but then we have iteration test where uh, the pilot communicate with the agent and this take a little 
more time. I mean, if we translate this more seconds, basically. And then as last step, we have the, the firmware deployment. So it is it is communicating with uh, uh, Raspberry and then it's uploading the the new firmware version. This in this step. Right. Yeah. This take a little bit time. Um. It's done. So this is an example of how we we were integration integrating uh, code and and to deployment uh, of the fifth the fifth word to the to the half word all right so if we analyze all these or oh, what we accomplished on this project we have this outcome so we did basically five showcase in three months um we push it, uh, you know, to have one um, load for validation and use of emergency mechanical uh, ventilators in Ecuador. Also, we did uh, basically three versions of mechanical ventilator. And finally, uh, we delivered it uh, we, and we had the validation of the correct operation of this device. Uh, and in, in Esmeraldas. Also, the key factors that we that we found on this on this project was the commitment of a stakeholder for the evolution of the pro, the product. And these stakeholders was were the doctors, technical staff, and sponsors. Also, another key factor was the design of an evolutionary software architecture. So this allowed to us uh, to iterate in a fast way. And build an extended the pro the extended device and features with with uh, confidence. Another another key factor was implementation of this strategy. So this was a decision that we take at the beginning and was um, something that helpful that something helpful for us across the project. And then finally, the implementation of a strategy for firmware and continuous integration and deployment was also another key factor in this project. So finally, to recap, we have three points in this, this um, project that we want to share with you. And, and first one is, it is very important to define the language of the business at the beginning of the project in order to show uh, the, the value that, we, that you added on the each stage. So this is more. This is related with uh, with the first phase. I mean, with the first uh, test that we did in our project. So at that moment, we were using a technical language so to show this frequency in the device. But at the end, our client that were the doctors and paramedics, um, they never under understood what we were trying to say at that moment. So they say, "You don't have frequency." Uh, because you are not using the correct language, I mean, the business language. Then another, another point, the second point here is, for the evolution of the IoT product, the commitment of a stakeholder is very important. Um, and yeah, that, that was for us very important because also the doctors, as, as uh, I showed it to you on the test part, was they were the persons that were running the end-to-end -end test, so they were validating the correct, uh, the current functionality, the, yeah, the correct behavior of the device, and also they were, at that moment, based on their experience, uh, validating that since that this, is, this was a new device, validating that this could be something helpful for 
any doctor on the contrary. Then we have the point number three, and this is the implementation of automated testing integration and continuous deployment drives to the, drives the rapid delivery of the value and give the technical team the confidence to add a new functionality or extend the product. So I would like to share with you, this is an example uh, IoT project set up basically on this repository. You can find uh, the setup or an example of set up um, where you will be where you will have a features like unit tests, integration tests, and pilot for for any IoT project that you would like to build in the future. And here we put how we also how we uh, did the setup in our project. And then we have Q and A. So feel free to ask anything related with the project. I will be um, asking questions also on the social uh, networks. Um, that's it. Thank you.